Okay, this is the Dance from the Core uh, series, and this section is about bones, muscles, and healthy practices. Please know that we're not learning every muscle and every bone. We're just learning about the specific ones that are going to be helpful for you to better understand um, them as they relate to dance. So bony landmarks that every dancer should know include the spinal column or vertebrae, the pelvis, the patella, which is the knee bone, the femur, which is this long bone of the leg, the head of the femur, which is a ball, the socket, which is the acetabulum, the greater trochanter, that's this little bony protrusion on the outside of the femur, the pubis, which is this center part right here below the core, the sitting bones, and then the coccyx, that's hidden behind there, that's the tailbone. There are five sections of the spine, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, and coccyx. They, they correlate to the times of the day that we eat, seven cervical vertebrae for breakfast, 12 thoracic vertebrae for lunch, and five lumbar vertebrae for dinner. The sacrum and the coccyx are one one each. Each one of these sections moves in its own unique way and these curves provide us with spring and cushion and act as shock absorbers when we walk, run, and move. The vertebrae at the bottom are larger to provide support for the weight. The spinal column are all the bones that create the spine. The vertebrae are the individual bones. The spinal cord is the nerve bundle that runs all the way down the center of our spinal column. The ligaments connect the spinal, um, the vertebrae together. The facet joints are these tiny joints that are in the back. The spinal nerves connect to the outer parts of our, the other parts of our body and help us move and allow us to feel pain. And the intervertebral discs, these are critical. These are the little discs that provide cushion in between each one of the bones. So let's like, take a closer look at these intervertebral discs. Of course, they provide cushion between the vertebrae. They're like jelly-filled balloons, gushers, or candy. They cannot be regenerated by the body. Bones can, the discs cannot. So when you injure a disc, for instance, here it shows that this disc is herniated, or you might have a slipped disc, or a torn disc, or a prolapsed disc. That is a serious injury. Often people get their vertebrae fused together. Currently there's no technology to fix these intervertebral discs, but I bet eventually there will be. One thing that contribute to hernia discs other than a sudden impact or injury are weak muscles and then lifting a box or a heavy object in the in a wrong way. The facet joints can also um, provide a lot of pain and as you can see as the spine bends forward and back um, they are affected as well. So let's look at what happens when uh, our spinal column cord is injured. Depending on the level of the injury, the higher up the injury, the more devastating the injury the outcome is. That's why it's so important that if you suspect that someone has a spinal injury that you not move them until uh, professional care is available. And now we have our pelvis. You can see this is a frontal view of the pelvis. We have the intervertebral discs and the individual vertebrae. The ASIS, which is the anterior superior iliac spine, a bony protrusion on the front of your hips. And the PSIS, you can feel for yourself, is a bony protrusion on the back of your hips. And then this is the iliac spine, or as we put our hands on our hips, this is what we feel. There's the sacrum, and down here we have the coccyx. This is the pubis, and down here we have the sitting bones. Greater trochanter over here. Women have a larger opening in their pelvis, because we have babies. Now basic understanding of the anatomy of a, a muscle. Basically there are these fibers, actin and myosin, 
that when they contract, they kind of feed parallel in between each other, and then when they uh, stretch or release, they spread apart. So as it begins, there are one of each. So as the muscle fibers con combine, one two by two to create more muscle fibers, and then those muscle fibers combine to create a um, a muscle group, and then those groups create to uh, combine to create a muscle. And as you can see, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it connects to a tendon and then to the bone. So they start in small bu bundles, and these bundles combine over and over again to create large muscles. So we, here we have our hamstring mu muscle group really consists of three muscles, which are the biceps femoris, the semimembranosus, and the semitendinosus. These three muscles combine to make the hamstring group. We engage these hamstrings when we extend, stand and lift the leg behind the center of gravity. So pulling or tearing a hamstring muscle is a common injury in dance, and it can be difficult to heal and recover from and what you really just need is a lot of rest. The quadricep muscles are the muscles that are in the front of the leg and there are four muscles in that group. The vastus intermedius, the rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, and the vastus medialis. Now I'm not expecting you to understand each of the names but I do need you to understand that this muscle group in front are called the quadriceps. We engage our quadriceps when lifting the leg as in a kick. The quadricep muscle is not easy, easily as injured as the, the uh, hamstring muscles. They're a larger, a more gross muscle, and, um, but they can add, add to a tilted pelvis. If they're too tight and they're not stretched out in the front, your pelvis can be malaligned, and so you want to make sure that there's a lot of flexibility in the hamstrings to make sure that the pelvis can align properly properly in standing alignment. Now let's look at the purposes of stretching. We stretch because it prevents injury, it increases flexibility, and it reduces soreness. These three concepts are critical in any kind of sports medicine or athletics, and they're the same thing that you'll hear from your PE teacher. Okay, these three purposes of stretching increase flexibility, preventing injury, and reducing soreness. Before we start, we want to make sure we have a gross motor warm-up. And that gross motor warm-up includes an increased heart rate, increased respiration, warming up the large muscle groups, and just doing big movements that warm up your whole body. The best time to stretch to increase your flexibility is at the very end of class or after a very hard workout because your muscles are warm and there's not a chance of injuring some. So you can push yourself farther into your flexibility. The best time to stretch to prevent injury is in the middle of class after you've done a gross water motor warm-up. So your muscles are a little bit warmed up and then you stretch a little bit and then you can do the rest of the class um, with a reduced uh, chance of injury. And the best time to stretch to reduce soreness is at the end of a class or after a bris brisk walk. At the end of a day is good as well. The top figure is stretching their left hamstring and their right quadricep muscle groups. The left knee is at a 90 degree angle here and the right hip is dropped down in a safe position making sure there's not pressure on the knee and the foot is pointed. So this is a ni really nice stretching position. and This is what I refer to as the runner's stretch. You will need to know this for your tests. Front leg is at a 90 degree angle here and the back hip is dropped. This position stretches your left hamstrings here and your right quadriceps. It's critical to, um, to stretch both muscle groups. Of course, if you were to reverse the legs, it would reverse the stretching. Here we have a hamstring stretch. 
This figure is practicing self safe and healthy pr practice because his sitting bones are connected to the floor. He is stretching the right hamstring. He is also stretching the left side of his torso. Now this is a yoga guy, but if he were a dancer, his foot would be stretched over and his leg would ro be rotated back and out from the hip. So he might want to draw his little toes down to the ground. Again though, his sitting bones would be on the floor. And then if he took this leg and stretched it out, it would be called a stride stretch. Okay, now we're going to fill in the blank. First one, read it to yourself. Answer is injury. To prevent injury, stretch after a gross warm motor warm-up that includes moving large, gross muscle groups and increased perspiration and hard heart rate. Second question. To increase flexibility, stretch at the end of class or activity. Third, to decrease soreness, stretch at the end of class or activity or take a walk at the end of the day. When we stretch, it, redu it reduces lactic acid and lactic acid is what makes us feel sore. So if you were to go into a professional dance class, you would not see them doing a stride stretch right off the bat. You would see them rolling and turning and folding and unfolding, maybe doing some abdominal work, um, uh, rotating around in their torso and their spine, twisting and spiraling. You wouldn't see them going into hardcore stretching. That's something that's really changed um, in the last 30 years and uh, in the field of dance because of the contributions of exercise science. Articulation, we can land softer and quieter. It prevents injuries to the joints and the feet by cushioning the landing. It trains our feet to point automatically using motor mem memory. We get higher jumps and leaps and aesthetics. It just what we expect and what we like to see are pointed feet. Aesthetics means is a word that refers to beauty and what we find beautiful. Here's an image of an articulating foot. You can see on the bottom. Then here we have the forced arch position and here the foot is pushed off into a pointed foot. Again, we want to push off with the toes. Lengthen through the toes, not crunch the toes. Think toe ball heel when landing. Press through the arch of the foot. Avoid flicking through the foot so that as we push off with the foot, our toes point down instead of flicking out. And the more we repeat this process and this action, the more our motor memory will take over and we will just point our feet automatically. Now let's look at the purposes of training to increase and strengthen outward rotation. Outward rotation training in dance is critical and these are the three reasons why. It provides increased range of motion. The greater trochanter, this bony protrusion on the outside of the femur, rotates down and out of the way to provide, if we lift our leg in parallel position, this greater trochanter lifts up and hits the pelvis. As you can see, here's the greater trochanter. It's rotated down. If it was here, it would come up and hit the pelvis. It also provides a broader base of the support. The feet connect to a larger area of space on the floor. And the last reason is aesthetics. Again, that's what we find beautiful. In our modern Western culture, we're used to seeing dancers performing with outwardly rotated legs and feet. And to us, that's beautiful. In some Eastern cultures, that's not the case. But for us in the Western culture, that's what we find beautiful. Cautions for articulating the spine. You want to make sure that your head drops first. Chin to your test. We move one vertebrae at a time. Your neck is released. You engage the core as you go older. As you can see this dancer here. She's dropping down and her core is engaged. And then if she were continued, she would all the way over and her, her body weight would be released forward. Her hips would be lifted. And then as she comes back up, she stacks the vertebrae one at a time on each other, one at a time, all the way up. 
this articulation of the spine is one of the elements of contemporary modern dance training. So here's a slide to help you turn in your assignment correctly. Take your notes, turn it in on time, in the proper place, and I will talk to you soon.